Hello everybody and welcome to episode number 18 of the Irish Knitting Podcast. Hello everybody, I am Sam, I'm an artist and aspiring knitting designer based in Dublin, in the Republic of Ireland. And you can find me all around the internet, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course on Ravelry, looking for Irish Farm Art, which is kind of my brand name. And I also have a Etsy shop in which I kind of sell my original artworks and of course a brand new website, irishfarmart.com in which I am trying to showcase my artistic and crafty world. So if you are interested, check it out. Any feedback will be much appreciated. If you are new to this channel, this is my uh, knitting podcast, uh, crafty vlog, in which I try to follow the classic knitting podcast schedule, talking about my finished works, works in progress, acquisitions and uh, literally anything that is going on in my crafty and artistic life. If you are a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back to this channel. Uh, last week I didn't manage to upload any podcast as uh, I took a week off, I was uh, on holidays and I visited the north of Spain, a beautiful town called Donostia or San Sebastian, which was uh, just an amazing surprise. I've been there before a few years ago and I just wanted to go back and uh, experience the city again and uh, get to know the town more and enjoy the amazing food. The temperatures there were quite high, so I'm really glad to be back to an Irish uh, summer, but that means that I didn't really uh, knit much or craft at all while I was on uh, vacation and that was kind of a conscious decision not to bring over any knitting project. I wanted to kind of break the yarn and get uh, a break. Um, it's been quite stressful, all this uh, a rush of making and crafting so I just wanted to reset everything and start fresh and brand new after recharging for a week with so much amazing food and beautiful scenery in Spain. Anyway I will probably talk about that um, this need for a break more at the very end of the video but uh, here we are we don't have many uh, finish works or new cast on but there's something done because as soon as I came back to Ireland I couldn't wait but cast on cast on and cast on again <laughs> so I did manage to finish a few projects the first of which is uh, a pair of slippers these are the double felted slippers from Sannes Garn. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name in Norwegian. Sannes Garn is a Norwegian brand for yarn and wool and uh, of course you probably have uh, seen some of their yarn before and tried it. It's quite popular especially in uh, uh, Europe and they come up with a beautiful pattern. I love their Marius jumper and you've seen many of those Mariuses in my uh, previous episodes. I really really love their patterns. I feel like they fit so well and they give you so much room for learning, improving your technique and stuff like that. This is a free pattern from Sunness and I am going to try and link below the pattern itself, but the pattern comes in Norwegian. I know there is an English translation, but I couldn't get a hold on that. Uh, probably in Europe is not easy to find it, uh, maybe in the US is uh, much easier, but I got to learn and slowly get obsessed by these beauties from Inge, 
out of the Nitty Tradition podcast. I'm sure everybody knows her. If you are here, if you are a knitter, you definitely know uh, the Nitty Tradition podcast. And in episode number 21, if I'm right, she is so kind to walk us through the pattern, give us all the measurements, stitch counts and uh, techniques to make these beautiful slippers. And uh, yeah, from there on, I watched her video many, many times and I wrote down the pattern in English with all Inga's um, uh, suggestions and recommendations and uh, I cast on this thing. I got back from Spain on Saturday and on Sunday night they were ready. They are a super quick knit and a very very effective piece of um, clothing or accessory and I definitely will make more. Let's talk about the yarn first. For this pair of uh, slippers I use a combination of Sunness per Dint, uh, which is a classic 100% wool DK yarn. In my opinion it's on the heavy DK side. It's about uh, 90 meters by 50 grams. It comes in 50 grams balls. Um, once again, I will put uh, all the links to the yarns and the specification of the yarn here on the screen or down in the um, comment section in the description or video notes. This because I'm terrible in converting meters to yards or grams to ounces. My mind can't get that. I'm really sorry for my imperial friends, but here we go, 91 meters by 50 grams. The wool is very, very, very rustic and uh, extraordinarily soft, so it's a pleasure to knit with. I had two balls, the uh, leftover from my bubble sweater, and um, in their charcoal color. It's kind of a speckleish, uh, very dark grey yarn. I held it with a strand of um, Holstgarn super soft wool, which is a very thin fingering weight yarn, in the fennel, flannel color, which is a kind of a medium grey. Uh, the pattern calls for a worsted weight to iron yarn and I didn't have any. I don't like to knit with that type of yarn, it's too heavy and uh, I don't get, really get uh, room in my projects for that yarn. So uh, being obsessed with this and needing to knit this up, I found myself to look in my stash and kind of make up what I had. The full project would take three bowls of uh, Pierre Gint and um, just a handful, of probably something like 50 grams of uh, the fingering weight yarn. Of course I had two bowls so I had to get something else and uh, in my host garden stash I had uh, a very similar color to the charcoal grey and uh, I hold uh, two strands of uh, that uh, kind of blackish uh, yarn fingering weight and a strand of um, the flannel grey. I really hope it makes sense. Now you can't really see the difference, why so? this jumps us to talk about the construction. So unfortunately I have them here felted and construction and I don't really want to mess them up so I'm going to put a little picture here and we can talk about the construction. You need them in the round starting from the bottom which is basically the heel over here and uh, you go up for a certain amount of stitches, you divide the stitch count in two and then you need the two feet kind of sock type of situation and you knit them up. When you knit the two socks it gets kind of a booby shape type of thing. Um, you then end up felting them uh, open 
and basically put one of the feet inside of the other on the wrong side and so it creates this lovely slipper it's a, a very interesting construction a very very clever uh, i think so the fact that uh, you can't tell the difference in yarn is because the host garn black yarn is on the inside of the slipper so on the outside it looks exactly similar to this one which makes me think that uh, you can definitely knit the two socks uh, the inside and the outside part of the slipper in two different yarns and it's a very good way to get rid of uh, uh, scrap the yarn that you have uh, around the place and uh, you won't really see anything. As far as you have the shell outside on the same yarn, it's, it's fine. Now, I realize they have a little bit of a different color and this is because uh, one is wet and the other one is uh, uh, fully dry. I had troubles, very big troubles in felting this. I kind of don't trust my washing machine and uh, the shorter cycle is kind of a 10 minute cycle but if you put a 10 minute cycle the temperature goes down to 20 degrees so you can't really felt much on that and putting on multiple cycle I just noticed that they weren't felting as well although technically being the yarn pure wool that would definitely felt. So what I've done is taking a big kitchen bowl, putting them in very hot water right from the kettle, a smidge of soap and just bashing them with a wooden spoon until they reach the point that I was kind of happy with. You can still tell, especially on the very dry one, the stitches and kind of the definition of the stitches if you want which tells me that uh, they are not felted enough but uh, i measure them on my foot and the size is quite right there is a little bit of uh, wiggle room for wearing a sock perhaps and i'm very happy with this i am not really planning of um, felting them more Size-wise, Inge gives you, or Salmes actually, gives you all a range of sizes from a very small um, child's foot all the way up to a European 46 men. I am a size 43, but as I didn't have a iron way or a bulky way yarn for this slipper, I even didn't have the suggested needles, which is a 5.5 needles. So I had to use what I had in my stash and the largest needle that I have is a 4.5 millimeter needles. So conscious of all of these, I decided to knit the larger size, which is meant to be for a 46 foot but uh, it shrunk down exactly for my foot size. So I'm very happy, a little bit of modification. The last modification I made is on the um, heel here on the back part. The pattern asks you to knit for 30 rows, which is like kind of a boot type of uh, construction. It gets much higher and uh, probably cozier if uh, you uh, want but uh, I kind of wanted this to be a slip on slip off type of thing to wear in the house during the winter so I went down to 30 rows and I got the um, cuff size is a cuff the ankle um, thing much smaller which uh, it's brilliant in my opinion I really love them and I really love the combination of sunless and um, um, host garden. 
and I ordered two more bowls of uh, Pierre Gint. They should be coming. I really want to make another pair of these and I kind of want to experiment more with felting and being a little bit more brave with that side of the house as well. So thanks very much to Inge for sharing with us all this beautiful pattern and uh, yeah, here you have it. These are the double felted slippers from Sun Scar. That was my obsession for the first part of the week. I just knitted on them. Take into account that one slipper takes you a day to knit, so it's quite fast. And although I didn't use the correct yarn way or the correct needle size, they were pretty fast as well. I suppose that uh, if you use the 5.5 mm needle and uh, iron way yarn, you could knit them in, I don't know, a few hours only, which is absolutely brilliant. Anyway, second finish work is the one that I'm wearing, and uh, you've seen this on my Instagram being announced, and this is my own. Um, jumper design. It's actually my second jumper design or garment design. Uh, the first that I made a few months ago, it's in my rubbery shop. It's um, a very classic uh, traditional northern Italian knitting pattern that I kind of modified to be a little bit more modern. It's done using a fingery way yarn and uh, we have sticking and drop sleeves. Very classic. Uh, Quite intimidating if you want, but I was really happy with that. For this design, I wanted to go more modern. And I'm seeing all these beautiful designers, the likes of Stephen West or Petit Nitz and you name it, using particular techniques in their designing construction, in their garment construction, and uh, writing the patterns in a way that you are guided through step by step. I am not used to that type of pattern. In my uh, history, <laughs> I have been knitting Italian patterns and uh, Norwegian, European patterns, commercial, commercial stuff that uh, don't really guide you through anything. They just give you a cast on and uh, you uh, have to knit for a certain amount of uh, centimeters, not even rows, and then they give you like very, very brief recommendations and it's up to you, which is brilliant because you end up having the room to modify your garment um, as better suits your body, but if you are new to the craft, it's quite difficult. And as well, I found that uh, the designer inputs get a bit lost in the making as everybody will need something a little bit different. So, having taken all of this into account, I decided to go with a modern style of uh, writing a pattern and uh, this is the result. What's modern about this, you may ask? Well, first of all, is a top-down construction, which uh, you know me, I absolutely despise. I haven't been successful in knitting a top-down jumper, um, apart from the bubble sweater and this one probably. It's, uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> it's a complicated thing. I'm probably so used of knitting bottom-ups that I know all the measurements and all the stitch count going up to my body. Uh, when I'm on the other way around, I find it quite difficult to get my head around. So this was a challenge, but I feel like we managed very, very well. It's probably the jumper that fits me the best. So it's top down, starting from the neck band. It's a very simple ribbing. Going down to the yoke, we have um, a few rounds of uh, short rows and they are scattered around the yoke from the very back of the collar piece all the way down to the shoulder. They are scattered in a way that uh, they actually shape the yoke 
on your back. I find that sometimes the um, short rows are all piled up in a section and this makes a little bit of a bulgy type of uh, construction and uh, the, basically the fabric tends to pile together and it doesn't really look nice and you need aggressive blocking or I find myself only, always pulling my jumpers down. So scattering the short rows, um, a few more at the beginning and then less and less and less going down to um, the yoke and the beginning of the body makes it to fit a little bit better. As well, we got a little, um, it's the similar idea of a short rows going down to the shoulder pads here on both sides. You have a few rows of, uh, I would say German short rows, uh, that is probably not the right way, but this means that your shoulders are as well shaped. All is intricated and uh, connected with the raglan decreases. Then, the complicated part. I kind of wanted originally to get my color work design incorporated in this mess of short rows and raglan decreases or increases actually. But first of all, that was extraordinarily complicated on a pattern designer side. So the color work pattern would be quite busy and difficult to follow probably. And the second piece is just that I didn't like the pattern to break on the raglan decrease here. So the construction is perfectly fine on the yoke and you get time to understand how to make short roll, how to scatter them and all this stuff. And then you will start very calmly your beautiful color work, both on the sleeve and on your body. I was afraid that this would uh, accentuate my kind of stomach part. I don't really need that <laughs> to get to look bigger, but um, it does not because it's just a very simple color work and it's very geometrical so the attention is not driven to the stomach piece but to the entire jumper if you wish. The last thing that I kind of engineered in this jumper is the tapering of the body. If you have followed me before you know that I tend to taper my jumpers just that tiny little bit. And so we get uh, a little bit of a better shape on the body and uh, it just fits so much better. This is designed for a masculine type of body and I really took that as a conscious decision because I feel like we boys need a little bit of a more attention designer wise uh, so many jumps are needed uh, for women um, and they are kind of translated into male jumpers in this case i really wanted to get all the feature that a male body might have so a thinner waist which is by the way not my case but a thinner waist and a larger um, shoulder area and uh, of course larger chest area as well. On the waist, as the tapering goes down, we get more uh, German short rows. These two create a little bit of a curve down towards the back of the jumper and I find that the jumper sits so so much better on your waist. It's uh, really fitted. I don't know if I managed to put some uh, pictures or a video here, but it's quite fitted. So it would look very nice in anybody, I suppose. And uh, the fact that we all have all these uh, differences in our body, all this modification and the possibility of scattering differently the short rows makes it uh, really customizable and wearable as well. The yarn that I used, it's um, 
a combination of different colors of a Cascade 220 Superwash, which is a DK yarn, and I'm reading the label, 100 gram ball by 200 meters, which is 3.5 ounces by 220 yards. It's um, a love-hate relationship that I have with this yarn. Love because I absolutely love the way that uh, this yarn knits up. It's extraordinarily gentle on your hands and uh, flies through the needles magically. I have never experienced something this pleasurable to knit with. I love this as well because the stitch, the stitch definition is great, it looks amazing, it looks almost like it's um, a rustic yarn, how um, you can get beautiful color work through this yarn. I hate this because uh, although it's super wash, should be machine washable, I ruined, completely destroyed a jumper knitted up in this exact yarn throwing in the washing machine, being careful of putting a very cold wash with no bashing around, like my general wool wash, but the jumper came out completely destroyed. Now, I don't know if it's the yarn's fault or if it's my washing machine's fault, but uh, yeah. So, I had a few balls of this yarn in my stash and uh, I really wanted to get uh, to try this again. I use, by the way, this blue, which is number 1924, probably. I kind of don't follow the numbers, but it's a ultramarine uh, blue, plain, very nice, my staple kind of blue color. I used a dark gray color, a magenta color, and a light gray color as well. Do you see them? Yeah. Here we are. The light, the dark grey part is a little bigger, then we go into the magenta, a little shorter, and then shorter again. The light grey color. And I think it's uh, it's quite nice altogether. So I, man I mentioned that uh, I put the yarn in the washing machine in a previous project, it got destroyed, and what did I do now to avoid that? Well, first of all, probably not washing in the washing machine, but as well using a tighter gauge to keep the yarn together a little bit better. This jumper has been washed and blocked, and as per my experience, the superwash will tend to expand a lot. But being the gauge a little bit tighter than the suggested one, the jumper kind of kept the shape together, so I didn't incur in any of that type of trouble. Which I think is the way to go with Superwash yarn, because I love it so much, I can wear it next to skin, which is something unheard for me, uh, wool-wise. I never ever wear wool on my skin, I find it so itchy. But this one, it's amazing, uh, I could wear this anyway. What to say about this jumper? I have written down the pattern in my size, which is um, kind of a medium, a regular size. Don't remember the measurement of my post, although I should probably measure them. I don't have a tape here. Anyway, I am trying to scale up and down the pattern to get a decent extensive size range. It's quite difficult because in the pattern for my size I gave exact stitch number for each short row and exact stitch number for each part of the jumper. So you exactly know where you are in any point of the jumper. Now I find that quite difficult to get the measurement for all the sizes that I wish. So I'm thinking or I give the pattern to a tech editor and ask for mercy and see what I can do or simplify the pattern a little bit, take off all the stitch counts, give a initial stitch count and then just say make the short row until the marker or whatever. 
I don't know what to do. I think that uh, having stitch counts is a good benchmark. If you are not familiar with uh, knitting a jumper or if you want the exact stage level in any given point, at the same time it's very difficult from a designer point of view, but you know, if you decide to be a designer you need to overcome this type of thing. The other part of me is bringing me back to my using Italian patterns or using Norwegian pattern in which they tell you just only the uh, stitch count and then they say knit up whatever and uh, very simple without any indication at all. So I'm trying to figure out if I can strike a balance between the two of them. But anyway, I think we spoke enough about this jumper. I don't have a name yet. If you have any suggestions for a name, comment down below. It would be quite interesting to understand how I can call it. Maybe something, I don't know, Irish here would be nice. But uh, yeah, here we go. Second Finnish word. Did I mention that I don't have many Finnish words, but I do have another. And this is fresh out of the needles, which is a beautiful pair of mittens. You might think that I'm completely bonkers of uh, making mittens in the middle of the summer. Even if this is an Irish summer, so it's not that warm, doesn't really call for mittens. Anyway, these mittens are part of a project that I'm involved in. If you have seen my previous uh, podcast, I was mentioning that uh, a local um, wool shop asked if I could kind of uh, take part of a workshop and teach a couple of classes on color work. So I jumped on it and very, very kindly they gave me free room to experiment. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm gonna come up with a pattern specifically for the workshop and uh, the people from the shop can create a little kit for the people that will be attending the workshop with their wools and their needles perhaps, and I can teach the workshop and get a pattern done. So this is the result. I feel like if you're coming to a workshop, why would you want to knit up a square just to learn how color work works? How on earth would you like to pay money, buy yarn, to knit up a swatch? So, I thought that if I attend a color work uh, workshop, I want as well to have a few skills and a project afterwards to bring home or to be able to knit with a skill to be able to get some more project, especially because this workshop will be um, host through um, before Christmas time. So people would um, love, in my opinion, to have something to knit for presents. And the pair of mittens is just great. It's simple enough, it gives you a lot of um, new skills and new possibilities. This pattern, though, I was given permission to put it uh, for sale, and it's for sale in my rubbery shop. It's the first kind of classic uh, mitten pattern that I have. I did another pair of mittens, the Wicklow mittens, but they are like the reversible type of mittens. You can find that in my rubbery page as well. So, these are knitted in BK yarn. It's uh, a super, super simple pair of mittens. So if you're new to color work, if you're new to knitting mittens, this is great. If you're new to knitting the round, this is great. The amount of skill that uh, this will give you, it's uh, brilliant in my opinion, because they will teach you to knit in the round, first off, knit color work, knit let me take them off. Knit gussets, so increasing and decreasing, and uh, knitting a thumb, which I think it's uh, 
a good set of skills to acquire. They are super simple, they don't take much and they only take 250 gram balls of yarn, actually a little less of the contrasting color. But they are great, the second one is still blocking. So you can find them in my rubbery shop. They are called, or they will be called, the Irish Fisherman Mitten. And uh, yeah, what else to say? The yarn that I used. I I use a cone of host garn and this is the white one that I held uh, double to make a DK way yarn and uh, the same in uh, the contrasting color. But working with the uh, people of the shop I may recommend some different yarns. Uh, this because, uh, you know, if you have this type of yarn it's fine but uh, it's quite difficult to come by. So. We'll see what I can do. I am going to make another swatch using a different brand of yarn and we'll see. But uh, any DK yarn will work. The size is a regular men, uh, medium hand size. And in the pattern I will give you a suggestion how to make them smaller or larger depending on your hand size. So, oh, and all, I'm very pleased with this pattern. I think it's a great introductory pattern for uh, mittens, for color work. And I like the fact that I didn't stick to the traditional Norwegian patterns for these mittens. And I put a little Irish ribbon or Irish knot design all over the back of the hand. and. Uh, a nice little uh, clada work on the tomb. The inside of the tomb matches precisely the inside of the palm as well. So another skill that you can add. So here we go. These are my Irish fisherman mittens and they will be for sale in my rubbery page. All the links are below in the description. So finish works are done and we get some time to talk about works in progress and uh, the first one that I have it's another and you may be bored about this going on but it's another original design of mine. This is what I'm saying when I had to take a break. I can't stop thinking about the designs, my mind just runs a thousand kilometers an hour thinking about uh, new pattern, new designs, what I can make with that specific yarn that is in my stash. And this happened when I was on holidays. When I was on holidays, I was planning my slippers, thinking about yarn, thinking about needles, what I can buy. And this is absolutely exhausting if it runs through a daily basis. But this means that I have more to show you today. And this is a design for a sock, which has a little cable pattern on the side of the socks. So let's address the elephant in the room here, the cables. Why am I making cables on socks? And you know that I absolutely despise cabling. Well, knitting on the jumper or sweater number 15 by um, my favorite things need to wear, is it? Anyway, I'm gonna check it. It's a full on cable. I will talk about that in a second. I got to appreciate the making cables, especially without a cable needle. And I wanted to try to make a sock pattern because I know that many of you guys don't really like uh, color work socks and uh, color work is my main type of knitting situation. So I feel like uh, having a pattern with cables or a little bit of lace may cater for a different type of audience and uh, give the possibility to more people to find out my patterns and especially because I 
want to include in this pattern my great grandmother's heel which is a construction that I am using over and over in my socks. It's brilliant, it's super simple and uh, it gives a lovely heel flap and gusset without any force of picking up stitches or anything. So this will probably give the possibility of people that are not forced about color work to get to know the type of construction which is I would say really dear to me, it's just a heel flap and gusset knitted in the round, but uh, it's something brand new that uh, my great grandmother just made and I was able to kind of retrace. So I only have a little bit of um, leg and cuff here, nothing much. I am planning to work on this extensively now that both the mittens and the slippers are done. But uh, yeah, I'm loving it and the yarn that I use, this yarn here, geez, I poke an eye with this thing. This is part of two skein I was gifted by a lovely lady from a local um, yarn shop, which, spoiler alert, is the yarn shop in which I will probably um, get my workshop done. This is Silver Moon yarn, is 100% Irish hand dyed yarn, it's 100% uh, merino wool for ply. Unfortunately, on the label, we don't have any indication about the metrage uh, or way of the skein, but I suppose it is a 100 gram skein. I have no idea about the metrage. I will ask and I will tell you if I get the chance. But it's this lovely kind of reddish and orange color with a lot of nice pinks and yellows as well, which is knitting up super beautifully. I am not false on 100% merino wool, especially for socks, but the caveat here is that I'm using smaller needles and so the gauge is a little bit tighter and the yarn is quite heavily plied. So I really hope this will give some structure to the sock itself. I'm seeing that on the camera now the color is really bright. It's not as bright as it looks here, it's a little bit more muted but the variegation is just beautiful. You can check the shop out and I suppose they just ship globally and uh, they have so much of this yarn in so many beautiful shades and the fact that it's hand dyed in Ireland it's just brilliant in my opinion so check them out, super great. Anyway, this will come eventually, hopefully by next podcast we get a sock done, it's really fiddly to knit with, but yeah. My last finished work, I just lost the ball of yarn, it's uh, of course the one that I just mentioned, this is the sweater number 15 by my favorite things, knitwear. It's a full-on cable um, sweater that starts from the back piece and then you knit the back part of the shoulders, the front part of the shoulder and you join in the round at the body part. I am just a couple of repetition of the pattern after joining in the round. I probably will need another 20 centimeters down for my body and waist, but I am super pleased with this. It uh, flies through quite easily. The pattern is addictive. You know, I can't wait to get to finish the plain rows to get to another um, cable turn and it's super easy to follow. So I was really afraid of uh, cabling before and if you remember well I did make the Spencer or I attempted to make the Spencer uh, sweater by <sighs> Brooklyn Tweed is it? Uh, I wasn't successful. Was it because of the pool? I don't know. Was it because of it was too complicated of the uh, project for someone that never done cables before? I don't know. 
but I end up to I end up reaping it and um, yeah and promising that I would never do cables anymore but the urge of having a squishy cable sweater was too big so I looked around and uh, I really like this pattern it's very simple it's the same type of cables all over the jumper and the instructions of uh, my favorite things knitwear are just amazing I am following them by the letter and flawless indeed the yarn that I'm using is a woolly knit cone. I feel like the color is um, Summer Storm or something like that. I will definitely put the um, details here and you can find them in my rubbery page. It's a dream yarn to knit with. If they weren't so expensive to ship and taxes and all of that shebang, I will definitely buy more of that yarn. And I'm really sad that I'm knitting this jumper because this means that I have less of the woolly knits yarn in my stash, which means that I can't afford to buy more of that. And when it's gone, it's gone. But you know, you can't keep yarn just for the show and touching it and sniffing it and you every now and then but you need to need to win so here we go that is my next uh, works in progress I will probably um, work quite extensively on that this week I don't plan to cast on anything new as part of my works in progress they are lethargic works in progress and they are languishing in a bag I have my uh, mom sweater that uh, big uh, 80s, 70s style sweater that I'm trying of uh, reconstructing from uh, a jumper that my mom knit when she was uh, a teenager. I finished the charting up of the color work pattern and now it's just repeating the color work over and over until the body and the sleeves are done. I am Posing it for a while, it's kind of boring and you know, you uh, are all excited about the project at the beginning and then uh, it flies through but eventually that will get finished. Now that all the pattern is charted down, it will fly through the needles, hopefully. The second work in progress that I have is the raised waffle blanket that I am making using Studio Donegal 100% uh, uh, wool, which is kind of a heavy decay yarn. It's a crochet pattern, super simple, super easy. It's just that it's summer. I have no feeling about knitting a massive blanket, and this massive is more than two meters long, backward and forward. And in a night, if I'm lucky watching television, I can knit a row, I can crochet a row, so it's very very slow and doesn't give me much joy. But hopefully with uh, winter coming and autumn I will get to focus on that as well. I don't have any plans of casting on anymore. But now I'm saying that I have a few jumpers in mind that are waiting there in my rubbery queue. Just waiting for payday to get some new host garn, yarn and uh, we'll see what will happen there. By the way, talking about host garn, I found that apart from their super soft wool, they have a wool and silk mix. Now, the super soft wool is great but it's very difficult to knit with. It's great when the garment is finished, super soft, amazing, couldn't recommend more, but it is a pain to knit with, especially if you're doing color work. So I was wondering if the silk yarn, wood and silk, may be a little bit easier to knit with. It, does it have the same quality of being soft enough and squishy when it's washed? Do you have any experience with that? It's not that much more expensive 
um, they don't have many many colors but uh, I don't know I kind of wanted something that was easier to knit with keeping in the realm of um, cones of yarn and uh, yeah as I can't afford anymore to buy at the wool knit yarns too expensive that old scarn is probably the last one that we have left here in the European Union so anyway do you know any other brands that I can get my hands on that are not coming from the UK. Nothing to take from the UK, it's just that import taxes are killing us all. That was it for my works in progress. And we do have the tiniest acquisition piece that you've ever seen in any knitting podcast. I got three extraordinarily small sock yarn balls. These are 25 grams of 75 by 25 uh, wool and nylon content. This is a brand called Katia. It's an Italian brand of yarn. I remember this precise label when I was a child and my mom had balls of this yarn with this Katia thing going on in the house everywhere and uh, yeah it was a kind of a nostalgic thing to buy but uh, as well it's uh, nice and squishy and i really love this uh, this yarn um, it says here made in romania or romania uh, in an english accent i don't know Anyway, it's a lovely sock yarn. I got three balls because I couldn't resist. I really love the label idea. And uh, yeah, it's just a blue and a white yarn. Let me give you some specifications. So I said 75 and 25. They are 25 gram balls and they are... Doesn't say, oh yes. 100 meters or 109 yards per ball, which is just a regular sock yarn. It's um, nice and squishy, nothing um, out of this world, uh, but yeah, I can't wait to knit up something with this and they are just so nice and cute and small. Any Bob, that's it for this week. We talk about uh, finished works, works in progress, uh, the tiniest acquisition you may have seen, and uh, a little bit of planning for the couple of weeks uh, between this podcast and next one. I think that's it for this podcast. And uh, yeah, I'm looking around because I'm sure there is something else that I'm forgetting. But anyway, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please consider to subscribe to this channel. We are so close to the 2,000 subscribers. It's not a big thing to have 2,000 subscribers, but uh, a little bit legitimize the fact that you are spending time that you could dedicate to other stuff to record a video. And as well, I like to think that this is my little knitting community. I don't personally have an eating community in real life, so it's great that you all people are interacting with me, teaching me stuff on a daily basis and reading all the comments really makes me feel part of the community. So whenever we reach the 2000 subscribers and I need to touch wood or steel as we do in Italy, I will... Um, pile up a giveaway to thank you all but um, yeah we need 20 more people or 15 actually anyway um, I really hope you enjoyed this and if you did please subscribe check out my uh, rubbery page uh, or my uh, Etsy shop and I will see you in a couple of weeks bye bye